there um, and having the panel chair and the participants on stage. I would also like to praise the volunteering and active participation spirit in the room because my poor joke of inviting somebody to chair the panel during the break resulted in some people actually approaching me and going for Cuba's job. So thank you very much for your active participation. Uh, yes, as Cuba would tell you, this is not, a, it's not an easy thing to do. So I will now invite you to a panel discussion on enterprises in the age of smart products. And I will hand the floor over to Kuba Gonchorowski, who will be chairing the panel. Kuba? Thank you. Oh, it's, it's already operational. So uh, I assume that we may, we may begin. Um, ladies and, and gentlemen, it is my utmost pleasure to invite you to the next panel of the Economic Forum of Young Leaders as your most humble host. Uh, as introduced, uh, I'm Kuba Gasiorowski. I'm a partner at Weber Lawyers. And today with my distinguished panelists, we will step into the brave new world of what is the presumptive fourth industrial revolution, which is the topic of this panel. Ladies and gentlemen, but what is the fourth industrial revolution? The first industrial revolution took place in 18th century and was about harnessing the power of steam. Then there was a second industrial revolution, which was centered around electricity and oil. It was followed by a third industrial revolution of the second half of 20th century, which was based on digital technology, personal computers, and the internet. And now some claim that we are facing a fourth wave of technological change. This concept first came to prominence as the German idea of Industry 4.0 in 2011. According to authors of this idea, uh, it was based on the merging of virtual and physical elements in the process of manufacturing. Yet, there is also another broader definition. It was coined by Professor Klaus Schwab, the founder of uh, World Economic Forum in Davos. He published a widely read, widely discussed book in which he claimed that the fourth industrial revolution is so much more than manufacturing and production. According to Professor Schwab, it's about fusion and interaction of new technologies across the physical, digital, and also the biological level. So that's kind of a fascinating topic, and we'll be discussing it today with our honored guests, which I would like to introduce now. First, Ms. Katarzyna Tomoń, a head of the Organizational Development Department in the Office of Board of Polish Company FACRO. Mr. Solis Billy, CEO of Ember Grid, Lithuania's natural gas transmission operator. <clears throat> Mr. Predrag Tasevski, founder of the Internet Governance Forum from Macedonia. <clears throat> so, shall we begin then? So, I would like to begin with a little provocative question just to stir up, stir up discussion. A few months ago, I've read a book by a former Forbes and Newsweek columnist, Mr. Dan Lyons. Uh, it's entitled, Disrupted My Adventure in the Startup Bubble. Uh, so one of Lyons' argument is that we live in a culture in which almost everything has to be startup, innovative, and disruptive. So is therefore Industry 4.0 and the Fourth Industrial Revolution a new buzzword, is there an actual fourth industrial revolution happening? And if yes, how would you define that concept? And I would like Predak to, to start to address this question. Unfortunately, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here and to address such a young and prospective generation and hope that this panel will bring many ideas and uh, encouragement for filling up your future. I haven't read the book, unfortunately. <laughs> Neither I heard about it, and definitely I will look for it afterwards. And when it comes to the full generation, frequently speaking, when it comes to a cyber, 
um, physical systems and implementation of the new generation technology and the buzzword startups. And this is actually what I do as well. I have um, established uh, several startups in the past and I'm still running a few more startups in different countries, in different continents as well. And it always comes to the topic of what we have to do in a startup. Startup, it's not about money. Startup, it's not about making money. Startup, it's about technology, but also it's about technology of not only to be a novel, to be a cutting edge technology, but also to be a something that makes users to use it, to be, to be useful, to be simple, to be understandable. So to make users to like it. It's not, startup, it's not a buzzword for, I always call it, it's not a buzzword for, I have an extremely good idea and I think I would like it, or my parents, or my syllabus, or my friends will like it. But that's not the idea. When you do a startup, you always have to think of it, what the others would like, what the others would want. Make sure that you make it simple as much as possible. And I understood that um, this university is a technical and business university and it has lots of new technology. And I also meant, uh, saw that you have cloud academy and so on. So you are trying to follow the new technology that are following up, that you're trying to be up to date with everything. And this is actually an extremely good idea. And this is how it should be. When it comes to a startup, you also you have to think of don't implement or don't think of, uh, don't be afraid to use all programming language or use all hacking techniques or use all technology. Make sure you use it properly. It's not about using it always the best and the latest technology. And when it comes to a startup, it's a big challenge, unfortunately. I have a few startups that failed, unfortunately. <laughs> a few startups that are still running. And few ideas that will follow up as well. So yeah, it's um, I totally agree it's a buzzword, unfortunately. It's not an unfortunate, it's a good thing, but it's not only about the technology transformation. And the one thing I actually want to mention here, um, if five years ago, in past five years, technology changes in six months, unfortunately today, technology changes more often. So it's not anymore six months, Maybe it's five, four, or three months. I don't know. I'm not a researcher in this topic, but however, I can see and I'm trying to cope with the new technology as well because you always want to be able to have a hands-on or to be able to hack or to be able to figure it out what is the new technology. So sorry to jump in here with yes, a follow-up question. So, so uh, your, your answer would be that there is a, a revolution in technology actually happening. Definitely, yes, okay. the revolution is happening. But is it happening in the right way? That's the right question. Well, we'll come up <laughs> with this one. Uh, so is, how, about, how about you? Do you think that there is a fourth industrial revolution happening? Could you gentlemen exchange uh, microphones? Yes, of course. Yes. <clears throat> Hello. So it's a pleasure to talk to the future, to our future. Uh, of course, uh, definitely tell about is it a revolution happening, only we can say when everybody will recognize that fifth revolution starting. But uh, in fact, uh, I do believe that we are in a permanent technology revolution. Uh, and when you have the latest technology and uh, if you start to think that you have the best in this state of art, then you lost because what is true yesterday, that's not true today, and it's not, it's not necessary, what is true today will be true tomorrow. Uh, so we are on a permanent development, a permanent revolution on technology side, because the people so they need better and something different each day, new ideas coming. And uh, in that respect, uh, there's a field for the startups. It's a really niche for the startups because um, big companies, they are too big for the new ideas. And uh, the corporate structures are cutting the appetite for the risk. Uh, startups, one startup for the one idea, so is the best approach. And don't be afraid to lose 
don't to be afraid to uh, uh, to fail. So it's a, just a lesson. If not, uh, not, not happens something with one idea, so you can switch to another. For the big companies, it's a too long time to de develop idea, to generate idea, to develop uh, study, and to pass all those corporate uh, steps uh, to get something done. So it's better to just spread idea if somebody has uh, on a web, and then look uh, if something do some uh, if something catches that, and then buy that startup. So that that is a way. And uh, why for the future is really niche. So first uh, message, yes, revolution technology revolution is ongoing. It's a permanent. And the second, with the new developments, this is a huge niche for the newcomers, for the young generation, with a huge appetite for the risk. And don't be afraid to fail. Great. So we've got two votes for yes, there is a fourth industrial revolution happening. And I forgot to mention that half of this panel will be conducted in Polish, so you might want to put your Industry 4.0 equipment on your ears. To samo pytanie chciałbym skierować do pani, pani Katarzyna Tomoń. Czy mamy do czynienia z czwartą rewolucją przemysłową? Jeśli tak, to czym ona jest? Proszę bardzo. Dzień dobry państwu. Ja mam przyjemność reprezentować przed państwem sądecką dużą firmę produkcyjną, firmę Fakro, która, która jest obecna na wielu światowych rynkach, więc możemy obserwować te zmiany zarówno technologiczne, jak i kulturowe, odpowiadać na nie z perspektywy producenta Fakro. Pan, panowie wcześniej powiedzieli, że te zmiany wymuszane są przez konsumentów, przez zachowania ludzi, którzy chcą żyć wygodniej, e, dostatnio, e, łatwiej wykonywać pewne rzeczy, więc za tymi potrzebami nadążają nowe technologie. Jeśli chodzi o same produkty, też one są modyfikowane pod potrzeby klientów. Firma Fakro ma w ofercie ponad 200 rodzajów produktów, grup produktowych, ponad 20 tysięcy indeksów i te wszystkie zmiany, które dzieją się również w ofercie produktowej, muszą być oparte o nowe technologie, które nadążą właśnie za tymi potrzebami produkcji pod klienta. Pytanie, czy technologia podąża za zmianami kulturowymi, czy zmiany kulturowe za technologią, bo to dzieje się właśnie równolegle, czyli te potrzeby dotarcia szybko do informacji, szybkich zmian, to, że to, tak jak Pan powiedział wcześniej, ten postęp technologiczny ma krótki cykl życia, wchodzą następne, nowe rozwiązania, one wypierają poprzednie, to wszystko powoduje, że ta technologia faktycznie wkracza w nasze, w nasze codzienne życie. A to, że ona ma miejsce, no to takimi liderami tej technologii nowej 4.0 jest Facebook, tak? Największa platforma informacji społecznościowych i reklamowych, która generalnie nie produkuje gazet, jak było to dotychczas, a stanowi medium informacyjne dla całego świata. Czy też Uber, który nie dysponuje własną flotą taksówkową, a spowodował ta myśl, o której mówił pierwszy prelegent, czyli ta myśl i sposób powiązania technologii w odpowiedzi na potrzeby rynku spowodowała, że to wszystko zafunkcjonowało. I takich rozwiązań właśnie potrzebuje współczesny świat. Więc myślę, że jest chyba 3.0, że technologia 4.0 wkraczyła w nasze życie. Dziękuję uprzejmie. So we've got three to nothing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the fourth industrial revolution by the verdict of this panel is happening. Uh, which actually brings me to the, uh, to the second topic. Uh, let's, let's put our imagination to work. Uh, in September 2015, the World Economic Forum asked 800 experts and executives about technological changes that will hit the mainstream in 10 years. I have picked some of them, clothes connected to the internet, reading glasses connected to the internet, but I believe that this already failed once, uh, implantable mobile phones, which is kind of creepy, and 3D printed consumer products, robotics, advanced robotics, and 3D printed organs. So I would like to begin now with, with Solis. What new industries you already see developing, maybe there's a hint of pitch for a business for you, dear audience, or, uh, and what new industries you imagine will emerge in the near future? Uh, so maybe I'm with a short fantasy, but I cannot imagine the implantable mobile phone because this is a fashion gadget 
and uh, you can imagine when it's implanted how you show it to the friends and also how you change it. So, um, yeah, in fact, the uh, industry on the permanent change as well, uh, so the based on technologies and uh, uh, even if from the, so I'm representing now the gas industry, so just a few years before, uh, competition was only physical. I mean, um, infrastructure competition. So, if you have the pipeline built or LNG, so then uh, you can import the commodity, and uh, so that is a way for one or another uh, source provider to deliver their goods to the market. Today, it's just enough to say and to demonstrate to the market that as an infrastructure owner, you can, within the certain period, say three years, to build another pipeline to another source, and it's not necessarily to do it. So that virtual pipeline, so it participates in the market already. And all these good suppliers evaluate that possibility building their uh, pricing policies. So that's very simple, very simple the example, how it uh, works now. Uh, so the robotics, again, uh, it's uh, not necessarily to think about something uh, extraordinary. Uh, right now, for us, uh, we have such a feature in our industry, it's called the capacity booking. And I will not <laughs> bother you with the details, but uh, the issue is uh, that uh, nomination should be done at the very last moment and very precise. So the, can our consumers use the robots on that. Why? Because robots are precise and it's a very boring job. So future will be uh, also uh, you know, so the future jobs uh, which will be allocated to the ro robots, to the artificial intelligence, so that's about the human being, what the jobs will be or to be allocated. But uh, from my perspective, the first jobs, that will be the boring jobs because nobody wants them, even they are good paid. So, so the short remarks, so I can continue another half a day, but... Thank you, thank you very much. There is a lot of food for thought, for food for thought and some ideas as well. I hope that you catch them. Uh, so, Predak, now, now I direct this question to you. What new industries you already see developing and what industries you foresee imagine in the near future? <clears throat> um, as I mentioned uh, previously, now we see a new transformation, so transformation to cloud. That is one of the most foreseen and one of the most uh, strategy view point of view of the industry and of the companies as well. And when we talk about everything moving to cloud or when you move things to cloud from on-premises, off-premises, then you come to an extremely difficult challenges. And one of the most difficult challenge is coming the risk and the security. But this is not only on the cloud transformation or cloud readiness topic. Also, you have it in the same time when it comes to the mobile devices. We have mobile devices being smarter than your PC, smarter and faster, and more capable to do things than your laptop. So the technology process, as I said, and it progresses so fast forward, even faster than human being does. So it chooses it choose the information and choose the data more aggressively than our human brain. But then, we have to be extremely very much careful. And this is why another um, challenge was taken care of for integrating and being implementing and asking for companies in Europe and in general and the global point of view to implement GDPR so then we can have a consumer data protection. This is a very important topic in security because if you don't, in, and in the industry as well, 
you have to make sure when you do the industry transformation, people always forget about one and for the most important part, data, policy, privacy, and security. Thank you so much. Uh, również panią chciałbym spytać, jakie w pani ocenie nowe branże wyłonią się z tej, wyłaniają się już teraz z tej czwartej rewolucji przemysłowej i jakie pojawią się w najbliższej przyszłości? Nowe branże, nowe rozwiązania, no w naszej najbliższej nam branży budowlanej, w produkcji materiałów budowlanych, systemy integrujące, tak jak FAK stosujemy na przykład system Z-Wave do inteligentnych domów, do integrowania różnych urządzeń, żeby ułatwiać. Tak to, to jest przyszłość właśnie, żeby w prosty sposób wiele rzeczy, ta synergia działania, żeby zadziałała. Bezpieczeństwo w cyberprzestrzeni również bardzo ważna branża, można powiedzieć, zabezpieczenia, ponieważ bardzo łatwo pozyskiwać, no, udostępniamy te dane w różnej formie, więc trzeba właśnie chronić tą i prywatność i dostęp do tych informacji, więc to też jest bardzo ważna kwestia związana z zagrożeniem przy rozwoju tych technologii. I powiem tak przekornie, że uważam, że nowe branże, które mają szansę rozwijać się, to jest psychologia i psychiatria, czyli żeby zadbać o te relacje międzyludzkie żeby nie przenosić życia w wirtualny świat, żebyśmy zachowali to nasze człowieczeństwo i umieli korzystać z nowych technologii, z nowych wyzwań, żeby się od nich nie uzależniać, nie być jakby sterowanym przez te nowe technologie, podpowiedzi, łatwe wyklikanie różnych rzeczy, tylko żeby to technologia służyła naszemu życiu i te relacje międzyludzkie były również zachowane. Thank you. Uh... So all of the panelists already touched upon a topic that I believe for our audience will be the most interesting one, the future of work, jobs and employment. What to do as to not be unemployed in the, in the, in the future. Um, uh, so in 2015, Deloitte issued a report showing that from historical perspective, technological progress generates more jobs than it destroys. Uh, they indicated uh, knowledge-intensive sectors, education, and healthcare. In December 2017, McKinsey Consulting Company published a report from which it seems that job loss will be balanced by, uh, job, by job creation. And the fun fact is that lawyers, which is my, which is my business, will uh, disappear in almost every economy that was examined. Uh, so that, that's not good for me. Uh, and moreover, in October 2017, the World Economic Forum issued yet another report in which, state, in which it stated that the significant demand will be in cybersecurity and cyber risk, which is what Bradrack already touched upon. So there are concerns that robots, AI will take the jobs from the people, but we see quite um, an optimistic picture as well. Uh, In connection with that, chciałbym skierować do Pani moje pytanie. Jakie branże, w jakich branżach trzeba szukać pracy w tej gospodarce 4.0 i czy tam jest miejsce na humanistów, o których Pani już wspomniała? Jak chodzi o, now, o nowe, aktualne potrzeby związane z e, pracownikami, z umiejętnościami, e, których szukamy aktualnie, to prawdą jest, że przy tym interaktywnym sterowaniu produkcją trzeba reagować technologicznie, więc informatycy, programiści, osoby, które potrafią administrować takimi systemami są bardzo poszukiwane, ale poszukiwane są osoby, poszukiwane są osoby które potrafią czytać dane bo te nowoczesne technologie umożliwiają dość szybki dostęp do danych online'owych, czyli na bieżąco, na podstawie których można planować przedsiębiorstwo, można reagować na, na bieżącą sytuację, więc ta analityka też jest bardzo poszukiwana, czyli jeszcze niehumanistyczne umiejętności, to na pewno. I też chciałam powiedzieć o takim stanowiskach, funkcjach jak analityk biznesowy. Osoba pośrednicząca pomiędzy technologią a biznesem. 
która potrafi opisać procesy, potrafi zdefiniować, narysować, a potem przełożyć je na technologię. To jest taka, teraz potrzebujemy programistów, informatyków, jest bardzo dużo zapotrzebowanie i żeby ułatwić im pracę, przygotować jak najwięcej dobrych danych po to, żeby programista maksymalnie skupił się na tej swojej specjalizacji, potrzebne jest to właśnie połączenie między światem biznesu a, a technologią. A jak chodzi o humanistów, no to dalej zostajemy przy relacjach międzyludzkich i sposobie komunikowania się firm ze światem, z klientami, z konsumentami. To jest na pewno też kompetencja, której firmy potrzebują, żeby umieć odnaleźć się w gorszu tych informacji i oferty, no, którą mamy. Tak? Mamy wybór z pomiędzy wielu właśnie produktów i usług. Thank you very much. It seems that there will be something to do for, for people still in the, in the future. Uh, Salis, what's your opinion? Will the fourth industrial revolution lead to creation of more jobs than the, than the jobs that will be destructed, destroyed? And what are the professions of the future? Is there a place for humanities? Yeah, of course, the history already shows that the technology advanced uh, so they creates more jobs rather than uh, so they, uh, quitting. And uh, uh, so, as I mentioned, the first will gun the boring jobs. And I would not speculate about what the professions would be needed in the future, but I would say that the two features which uh, persons are needed for the future and would be most uh, demanded. Uh, first is uh, fantasy and creativity, and the second is responsibility. So, and to be responsible, responsible person, it means free person and free-minded, risk appetite. So, when you don't afraid to dream, and so they work on that, those dreams, so they, to implement those, so you are a future leader. That, that, that's, that's pretty simple. I really loved that, that, that answer. Um, responsibility and and imagination creativity that's 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 nice <laughs> uh, so the same question goes to to you will be the more or less jobs for human beings and how about humanities it's a quite interesting question to be honest and i have to be frank uh, with the young generation don't be afraid that robots or technology will take your job no they will create higher jobs and even more paid jobs for you. So technology becomes more smarter, but smarter people have to manage them. So therefore, I recommend you education, education, and education. However, I have one theory. I haven't I have this theory for a couple of long time and I haven't shared it, but I would like to share it today with you because with such a young generation, I feel it very comfortable because I'm in most of your age as well. That's nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so my entire background in education is computer science, engineering computer science. Uh, so I've learned how to hack technology, learn how to secure technology, and so on and so on. So I will give you an... At that time, when I was starting my university, technology was not that available. It was not that visible as it is now. At that time, there was no YouTube. At that time, I had a dial-up connection. I had to hide the bills every month from my parents. You don't have to do this anymore. You have it in your phone. You have it everywhere. I recommend to new generation, don't study computer engineering or computer science education. Do physics, math, biology, chemistry, languages, everything else, or business administration, and everything else. And then, on the free time, use YouTube wisely. Use it for online education. Use online platforms, education platforms, to advance your skills. I've worked with many people from around the world, and frankly speaking, I figured out that the best engineers, or what I call them, the best hackers, are the ones who are self-taught. And in my past experience, I've learned at the education, at the universities, several languages, program languages. But to be honest, I've never used those 
program languages until now. And now I have to learn new ones. So I'm advancing myself still. So I'm still learning new language and new language. So that is why I say education, education, education. Three times education, really important. And do any other thing studying rather than technology, you'll be fine. Or do engineer, uh, uh, such as um, engineering, architecture, or anything that will help you. And you will have to use everyday technology as well. So this is my thing, and never be afraid of technology. Do not kick robots, please. Because I've seen some YouTubes where they kick robots. Please, do not kick robots. They will not take your job. So you've got a really nuanced answer. It's not a simple one. Go to a, a cyber programming school or something and become a programmer. You've got uh, business analytics and uh, psychology. You've got responsibility and imagination. And you've got everything from physics through, uh, through biology uh, to, to doing things to self teaching yourself in, in, in your free time. So we've covered several grounds. What is the fourth industrial revolution? Is it happening? What will be the new products? What will be the new professions? So let's step into the, into the darkness or into the mist, gray mist. In the latest Warner Bros. Justice League movie, uh, which I loved, uh, there is a discussion between Batman and Wonder Woman. I won't give any spoilers, don't be afraid. And Wonder Woman delivers a great line in that movie to, the, to Batman, saying, technology without reason, without heart, destroys us. And this view seems to be shared by Professor Schwab of the World Economic Forum, who in his book states extensively about the need to approach the industry full zero with both reason and empathy. And even this month, white paper of the World Economic Forum proposes, for example, introducing politics and ethic calls at the engineering studies at the university. So my question comes to Predrak. What ethical challenges does the fourth industrial revolution pose? And what are the means of exercising control over the rise of technology? Whew, that's a big question. <laughs> that is. I always say, when we have the technology transformation, and when you transform it to the industry of all, to the sub-epsychopusical uh, systems, there is only one thing that is missing, and there is only one thing that I've always emphasized that should be first step. That is the strategy. If you have a proper written strategy or a goal or mission and vision, then everything else will follow up. If you don't have it, unfortunately, it will not have heart, as you mentioned. But whenever, whenever, nevertheless, there are things when you create a strategy, and I've seen good strategies and bad strategies, and when you create a strategy, it's not only what is to be done, but also it has to underline the capabilities, the capacities. Is it possible to do this? Is it possible to implement this? Or what we are trying to achieve with it? Another point when it comes to a strategy, another, in fact, most important point for me that is always missing and is educational culture. We always have to think that education from younger age to the older age has to be continuously. We only have now from younger age to the middle age, and that's it. And afterwards, you just work and you do nothing. You just make money. No, you have to continue to educate yourself. Then we have to look on the opportunities of the use cases and examples that have been done and how is the limitation about it. Another thing when it comes, again I will mention it, cloud computer readiness. Uh, the colleague also mentioned that when it, when it comes to a technology, architecture is really important. Infrastructure, network layers, security, implementation, and so on. The, I always find it very, 
very kind of intriguing that when we call and when we talk about uh, industry transformation, we always say, and there are only two buzzwords, cost savings, cost efficiency. We invent those technologies to save us money. I fortunately or totally disagree with it. There is no cost efficiency. Maybe there is some hope, but on the other hand, which is good, and this is why I said before, you should not be afraid that you should not be without jobs because the new technology creates new jobs, higher jobs, which will be paid more. Of course, more responsibility, fortunately, for you, but still, it will bring more challenges for you. Thank you so much. So uh, the similar question goes to Solis. Are we facing uh, an Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator <laughs> scenario? What are the ethical challenges of the industry 4.0 and how, we, how can we control this, this technical revolution? Well, <clears throat> it's uh, not a speciality of the fourth revolution or third revolution, industry revolution. Um, please remember that whatever the technology which is established to serve the humanity could be used against the human beings. Everywhere, every, every technology. We start about nuclear energy, which is energy provider or nuclear bomb. We talk about the chemistry, where the same uh, preparate can be the, uh, either medicine, either the poison, and about everything. So why, again, I come to the responsibility? When you develop technologies, you should be the responsible and always think about what you do and also about the users. And uh, in that respect, I can tell that lawyers will not disappear in the future and the justice system as well. They only, only switch to the other technologies. At least yeah. you will be solicited. <laughs> yeah, so again, responsibility, and uh, that comes again with the science, with the studies, and when you study engineering, when you study programming, when you study whatever, do not forget the soft issues. The first is philosophy. So that is the key. So the old knowledge, old humanity knowledge, this is a very, very important. And why the key value for the future on the education, it's a typical, it's just old fashioned university education. It's just old fashioned, I mean, it's a combination of the new features and also old treasuries, like as philosophy and the old languages. So that's very important because university should grow the personality which is developed in other all aspects, not just a single knowledge, single-sided knowledge. Oh, it's, it's nice to hear from, from all of you that uh, uh, you are all business science people that ethics, philosophy and humanity still do, do, do matter. Um, teraz chciałbym uh, także pani zadać, zadać to pytanie, jakie wyzwania etyczne uh, wiążą się z czwartą rewolucją przemysłową i jak możemy je kontrolować? Praktycznie podsumuję wypowiedzi moich poprzedników, bo uważam, że technologia właśnie powinna służyć człowieczeństwu i to powinno być na punkt jeden w każdym kodeksie etyki związanym właśnie z rozwojem technologii. Powinniśmy umieć z niej korzystać i tutaj chodzi o tą wiedzę, czyli Przedszkolak inaczej będzie korzystał z nowych technologii, jak osoba dorosła. Przedszkolak powinien najpierw zainteresować się życiem, co się dzieje wokół niego, to co pan powiedział, fizyką, chemią, zjawiskami, a później umiejętnie korzystać z nowych technologii. I ważne jest, żebyśmy rozmawiali o zagrożeniach, bo aktualnie nowe technologie są własnością zamożnych państw, zamożnych korporacji, żeby nie dochodziło do takiej polaryzacji i władzy, i kapitału. Bo to jest niebezpieczeństwo, które za tym idzie i jeśli zapomnimy o tym, że technologie mają służyć człowieczeństwu, to to jest bardzo niebezpieczna droga. Rozmawialiśmy właśnie przed panelem kwestii militarnych. Czy ktoś z nas wyobraża sobie wojsko, roboty sterowane z jednego centralnego miejsca 
i kwestia właśnie bezpieczeństwa później i nasze, naszego bezpieczeństwa i całego systemu, który, który w ten sposób by funkcjonował. Więc jeśli ma, pamiętamy o tym, że technologie mają służyć człowiekowi, no to to jest punkt jeden kodeksie etyki. Świetnie. So we've got a strategy, responsibility and making the technology serve humanity, serve people in the, in the first place. So let's get out of the, of the darkness uh, and, and let's step into the world of, of business. And um, that's, that's the question I would like to address to you, to Ms. Tomang. So uh, many countries want the state, the government, to play a great role in the Industrial Revolution. An obvious example is, is China with its reported Made in China 2025 strategy, uh, and which, according to British Guardian, uh, will amount to $3 billion of state support. Then we closer to our region, as reported by European Commission, we've got Lithuania or Poland, which plan to balance the public-private partnership. So my question is, and I'll ask it in, in, in Polish, uh, kto powinien być odpowiedzialny za wdrażanie, w ogóle czy powinno być wdra coś takiego jak wdrażanie czwartej rewolucji przemysłowej? Czy powinno to się odbywać ze środków publicznych, prywatnych? Jak powinno czuwać nad tym państwo? Jak państwo może pomóc przez środowisko regulacyjne? Państwo, powiedzmy, że polskie, ma niezwykle ważny interes w rozwijaniu nowych technologii i w innowacyjności, która jest za, za chwilę, tak, można, można używać tych dwóch określeń. Dlatego, że rozwój gospodarczy kraju, czyli zamożność mieszkańców, obywateli, i jest wprost proporcjonalna do poziomu innowacyjności i zastosowania nowych technologii w danym państwie. O tym mówi na przykład Fundacja Pomyśl o Przyszłości w raporcie Dlaczego w Polsce zarabiamy cztery razy mniej niż w innych bogatych krajach europejskich. Skąd to się bierze? Stosując nowe technologie w, produkcie, w produkcji prawda, jest to wartość dodana, za którą zapłaci klient. Jeśli my tylko korzystamy z nowych technologii, a nie jesteśmy ich właścicielem, to finansujemy miejsca pracy w zagranicznych korporacjach poza naszym krajem. A musimy stosować takie technologie, dlatego żeby odpowiedzieć na działania konkurencji, która raz, że jest pewnie bogatsza, dłużej na rynku, ma łatwiejszy dostęp do technologii i właśnie państwo wspiera stosowanie nowych rozwiązań. Dlatego są bardziej konkurencyjni, a polskie firmy muszą za tym, za tym nadążyć. Jeśli firma FACRO ma 176 zgłoszeń patentowych, to też mamy doświadczenie, jak procedury, jak system jest zorganizowany źle, że nie sprzyja tej innowacyjności, a tym samym wdrażaniu nowych technologii. Na uzyskanie ochrony patentowej w Polsce czekamy 3-4 lata. W tym momencie konkurencja jest już dużo, dużo dalej. Jedno zgłoszenie patentowe, koszty związane ze zgłoszeniem do Europejskiego Urzędu Patentowego, to na początek jest 15 tysięcy złotych. Tylko większe firmy duże stać na takie koszty związane z opatentowaniem myśli, nowych rozwiązań. Do tego nakładają się właśnie te bezwładność procedur, czy 4 lata. No w ten sposób nie wyprzedzimy innych krajów europejskich i światowych. Jeśli państwo coś z tym nie zrobi, nie zacznie myśleć, że to jest w interesie obywateli i budżetu państwa, żeby nowe technologie, rozwiązania systemowe, dostęp do wiedzy w ten sposób zorganizować, żeby to mogło się zadziać tutaj w Polsce. Jest to bardzo ważne i ta świadomość tego interesu naszego i ekonomicznego, gospodarczego z każdej strony, nie tylko, że to jest temat biznesu i zorganizujcie sobie nowe technologie i odpowiadajcie na działania konkurencji, tylko to jest kwestia zamożności w danym państwie. Więc państwo powinno tworzyć rozwiązania, które temu będą sprzyjały. Thank you. So we've got a big role for a state to play in terms of uh, speeding up things, uh, the, the regulations and the patent process, the protection of or, and, and access to ideas. Salis, what's your idea? What is the right approach to the fourth industrial revolution? Should it be public or private driven? And what role should public sector play in it? Uh, so definitely, uh, that should be the balanced one. And uh, that comes from the practical issues. All we are human beings and all we know that uh, 
one-sided pressure creates the resistance. And uh, the governments, the public sector, they are limited by legislation on the speed of the uh, whatever the changes. And uh, so definitely that's all the ideas, they are generated by the private sector, mostly. So, but it's very important, the cooperation between the public and private sector. Uh, public sector to understand the ideas which provided by the, or offered by the private sector and be able to react quickly with the regulations. Because you can imagine, uh, so the, if you come with a new idea and implementation is very valuable and creates the prosperity for the country, and, but change of regulation would take five years. What the value for your invention is negative because it will create depression in the country. So, and uh, also the public sector, uh, we are some jealous on the innovations, even they cannot produce it. Why it's very important, uh, education of the public sector, which, why it's very important that young people, very educated people, go to the public sector. Why it's important that public sector should be paid the same as a private, because they also need the knowledge there to understand new ideas which come from the private sector and react immediately with the change of the regulations. So that is the key, cooperation, understanding and the knowledge, creativity on the both sides. Thank you so much. So, uh, Predrag, the same question goes to you. Uh, what's the balance between public and private in the in industry 4.0? Uh, I guess uh, that's quite interesting from the perspective of cybersecurity, the role of the state. If you could wrap up our discussion with, with your answer. Yeah. Um, this is a one million dollars question, to be honest. <laughs> For such, uh, for a couple of countries in the region, in Europe, and so on, uh, and I've done uh, several public publications, research papers, and white papers regarding this topic. That not only on the industry transformation, PPTC public uh, private partnership is important, but also on the security level and everything. I call it mostly. I don't call it PPT because it's too. Acronyms, I always call it multi stakeholder should be taken. And always should be taken into a sense of balance between every organization, every stakeholder. No matter is it the government, NGOs, NPOs, education, or private entity. It has to have and has to be involved in any decision making. Decision making should not go from bottom to top. That is an old-fashioned way. We are now in the information. Industry, transformation, we are now in the cyber world. We have to make more rapid, more quick, and more swift decisions. And to make those decisions, we have to identify which are the subject matter experts for such topic, and create a multi-stakeholder partnership or a trusty entity, which I will call them, and do and make a decisions from top to bottom. Perfect. So much, uh, so much thanks goes to all of you for participation in this wonderful discussion. We had a, a free and uh, and inspiring exchange of ideas. I would like ask the audience to reward our panelists with, with a round of applause. Please enjoy the rest of your stay in, in Novosange and see you around. Thank you.